Hello and welcome to our special Breaking the Stigma Children and Mental Health. I'm Cindy Hsu at Bronx Collegiate Academy on the Taft High School Educational Campus with our partners from I Will Graduate. Over the next half hour, we'll give you an in-depth look at the internal problems children face but are not often discussed. We'll hear directly from children and teenagers about their struggles. We'll explore the challenges of finding the right care amid a nationwide shortage of youth mental health professionals. We'll learn about how a child's race might impact their ability to find the right therapist. And we'll look at some organizations giving children the tools to help them manage their feelings. I spoke with a class of students about mental health alongside I Will Graduate. Students' anxieties range from dealing with stress at school to tackling problems in their personal lives. That idea was on display at Long Island Center Mariches High School. Students shared their feelings with one another. And as Jenna DeAngelis reports, in the process, they found another source of strength. So being a teenager is fun and exciting, but there's no doubt it's challenging and you probably face challenges very different from myself or your teachers when we were in your shoes so I want to have an open discussion with you guys about mental health mental health is an important part of our overall health I first want to ask you what do you think contributes to overall mental health struggles for teens sports yeah schoolwork social media just like an overload of stuff that we have to deal with throughout the day, like a day-to-day -day basis. The pressure of it all, a common theme with both groups of students we sat down with at Center Marich's High School with a focus on social media. I feel like social media sets a certain standard. It raises the bar a lot. You never know what's gonna pop up on your feed, what you can read and how it can affect you, the things you see. Trying to fit in with everybody and trying to be as popular as everyone else. And how do you cope with social media? It's really important to take breaks because I feel like when you're constantly on social media, you compare yourself to people. My parents didn't let me have like certain social medias till I was older. And at the time, I would complain about it. But now I'm just so thankful that I didn't experience it to an older age. I'm going to read you guys a statistic. A 2021 study from the CDC found nearly 60% of female students and nearly 70% of LGBTQ plus students experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. Does this come as a surprise to you? No. 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 The students say the pandemic played a big part, explaining the isolation weighed on them. To help the students, this school has various programs and clubs centered around mental health and well-being. This program, Runch, gives the students the option to gather and get exercise rather than just sit around at lunch. Making new friends, uh, become more social. These are can forget, quote unquote, about school and just like decompress. They feel better. They feel better physically, they feel better mentally, they feel better emotionally. So it's kind of like a little bit of like a serotonin release for them in a way. Then there's Goal Getters, a more structured program run by assistant principal Katie Foreman, using the weight room to focus on meeting physical and academic goals. I feel I need to be a part of something like this because I personally struggled with depression. I've seen myself being more happy, wanting to come here more, wanting to complete more of my work. In the start of this year, like I kind of like got into some trouble and it was going through like a really hard time. And going here every day really helped me and improved not only with like my school academics but also with my home life. For those who prefer a different outlet, there's mindfulness and yoga. Start with a little bit of just centering. From breathwork to journaling, the club offers students tools to cope with anxiety and stress. I think that it reminds them that they have agency over how they feel, that they can control their anxiety a little bit better, and that wherever they are, they can use these tools. The school's that. principal says in a short time, these programs are making a difference. I'm seeing the results in behavior and academics and attendance. At school, we should be a safe space. We should be a safe place for them. We should be somewhere that they don't dread to go, but that they get excited to go. And that's what we're finding. Sentiments echoed by these students who feel the support here. It really changes your school day when you're not just in class going through the motions. You have other stuff to look forward to. The openness, allowing to like go to one of our, you know, faculty and just being able to talk to them. So I want you to help us help you. If I'm a parent and I'm concerned about my child's well-being, how do you think I should approach my child? Be relatable. Don't come off and be like, oh, why haven't you been doing your homework? Why haven't you been doing this? When you're like shouting at someone, when you're, even just the way you say things, it might not even be what you say, but how you say it. You can just be like, 
oh, I noticed that you've been, you know, coming and going straight to your room. Is there anything that's bothering you? Instead of being like, all you do is come home, get on your phone, stay upstairs, <laughs> da, da, da. It's like, you don't have to be like that. Just being open and honest, like, yes, they are your parent, but sometimes they have to be that friend you need to just openly talk to. I think just letting your kid know, like, no matter what it is, no matter what it is you're going through, no matter how bad it is, like, you can come to us and talk to us, you know, and we won't get mad at you. How important is it to you all that mental health is prioritized? I think it's extremely important, but I think the most important thing is normalizing it. It helps everyone realize that mental health struggles are real and they're everywhere. It's not just something you hear about every once in a while. It affects everyone, everywhere. I think it's also important that we're breaking the stigma. Like, there's such a I feel like there's such a stigma around mental health, and I mean, I've never really struggled with it until like this year, so just having people who are willing to listen and to talk to you about it and to help you through it, it's just, it's a lot. It really makes a difference. For these teens, sitting side by side, knowing <laughs> they're in this together, <laughs> there's power in that. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated mental health struggles among children and teenagers. Tim McNicholas went to a school in Manhattan where students are finding comfort. Behind the hustle and bustle of Manhattan and tucked away beneath another busy school day. So we're going to get started with three deep breaths. A break. 45 tranquil minutes here in the basement of New Design High School on the Lower East Side. On your inhale, shrug your shoulders up. Where these kids forget about calculus and chemistry. And exhale. And clear their minds through yoga. It gives you like release out of all the stress that you've been going through, especially during school, colleges, going through the college process and stuff like that. New Design is one of seven New York City public schools currently offering yoga courses through Bent on Learning, a nonprofit that launched in 2001 and then started teaching stress management at schools near Ground Zero after 9 11. Exhale, down dog. Bent on Learning invited me to a course and showed me how they navigate a new challenge. The pandemic has definitely had a significant impact on kids and uh, we, you know, hope that the practices that we're teaching them will uh, give them the skills that they need to, um, like I said, you know, manage their emotions. It's one tool in the battle against a complex problem. Experts say feelings of sadness and suicidal thoughts in kids were already rising, then the pandemic only worsened the problem. A recent study found 60% of youth with major depression do not get any mental health treatment. We're facing a national crisis of children's mental health. At the same time, there are not enough child and adolescent psychiatrists. Dr. Warren Ng is a professor of psychiatry with Columbia University and the president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, or AACAP. Data from that organization shows all 50 states suffer a statewide shortage of child psychiatrists, defined as fewer than 47 per 100,000 children. What does that mean for kids in this country? It means that it means that we're facing the reality of underinvestment in terms of acknowledging the mental health needs of children and adolescents. New York and New Jersey fare better than most states. And when it comes to counties, Manhattan is a rare example where the number of child psychiatrists exceeds the need. But there is room for improvement in New York City. Particularly children of color, communities of color and lower income, those kids continue to be underserved, even within heavily sort of um, enriched environments like Manhattan or New York City. Back at New Design High School, <laughs> freshman Estrella Miranda says she's feeling a change from how she felt during the height of the pandemic. I was like really stressed and my mental health wasn't that good, I feel. Having yoga and being able to like be with yourself and have like some sort of peace of mind is really nice. Surrender, soften, release. Coming up, overcoming the stigma of mental illness. In the black communities, this is how we feel. And, um, and not enough understanding of what mental illness is. Meet one mother whose son's death inspired her to create change in her community. And amid a shortage of child and teen psychologists, the organizations aimed at filling the void.
Welcome back to our special report, Breaking the Stigma, Children and Mental Health. Alarming statistics when it comes to suicide. Suicide rates among young black people has nearly doubled since 2014. Mental health advocates say continuing racial and social inequities have been driving those numbers up. As CBS 2's Christine Sloan reports, a mother who lost her son to suicide wants to make sure no other family ever goes to the pain she's going through. Darren, first of all, he was my absolute favorite person in the world. He had a smile that would literally melt your heart. Her son, Darren Clark Jr., was just 24 years old when he died by suicide in 2018. He had been struggling with depression and bipolar disorder since the seventh grade. Just how much I miss him, I love him, and yeah, I wish he was here. It eats me up inside because I feel like he did this to help me when in reality, it just made me worse. Deidre Alita Asima remembers one of her son's last text messages a week before he took his own life in their Bloomfield, New Jersey home, telling her he didn't want to be a deterrent. He told me how he was going to do it, why he had to do it. He just couldn't do it anymore. As she had for years, the doting mother got her son help, putting him in the hospital, where she says doctors prescribed him more medications, which gave him access to more pills. Looking back, she wishes she had shared her pain with others instead of mostly praying privately. I think a lot of, you know, in the black communities, this is how we feel, and, um, and not enough understanding of what mental illness is. One study finds that among black children between 5 and 12, the suicide rate was twice that of their white counterparts in 2017. Dr. Jeff Gardier says black children living in high crime areas are more exposed. There is depression and they just feel that they have no one to turn to or no one can really understand what it is that they're going through. That's why Aled Asiyama says she started a foundation in Darren's name to help families and those struggling with mental health conditions. The Darren Clark Jr. Memorial Foundation, started soon after her son's death, has provided support for Tana Dupree's two children. Both of my children have been hospitalized for attempts multiple times. My youngest child has anxiety and depression, and through the foundation, um, I was able to get both of them into therapy. And it has helped them tremendously. Because we know that not all pain is visible. So the goal is actually to bring the resources to people. For Asima, helping others brings her comfort. One struggle for children and parents is finding the proper care. And experts say for many people of color, it's difficult getting professional help from someone of the same race. But there's one program getting more minority high school students interested in the field. Shaniqua Moore I'm is really kicking off the first mental health career class at Health Opportunities here. High School in the Bronx, the same school she graduated from years ago. Sometimes if you have a parent that has depression or a mental health disorder, being in that environment, you could be more likely to also get a mental health disorder. Moore grew up in the South Bronx in poverty and surrounded by crime. I was exposed to a lot. Community violence, unfortunately seeing people that I grew up with murdered. Um, a lot of them are probably not here today because they didn't make it. Now it's time to take that experience, turn that pain into triumph and transform lives of kids that are going through the same. And more triumphed. She earned a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in social work from Columbia University. Then 11 years ago, she started the nonprofit I Raise, a mentoring program for young girls 9 to 18 living in NYCHA housing in the North Bronx. It's now grown into an organization that's reached more than 15,000 students through multiple programs, setting historically underserved boys and girls on the path to success. The latest effort is this class at Moore's High School alma mater, a safe space for students to talk and learn about mental health. 
Senior Gerard Hagen was pleasantly surprised. I've been in a lot of different settings where people say it's open and people have their own ideas, but this one really had, you know, conversation and back and forth kind of topics. I felt like the class was really amazing. I got to open up with the teachers. Even though this was my first time, I really, like, look forward to this class. In this weekly class, students will talk things out, learn to recognize mental illness, and find out ways to help others and themselves. They'll also learn what it takes to pursue a career in mental health, where there's a great need for professionals of color. When they are connected to a therapist of color, they're more likely to do better in therapy for many reasons. One of the reasons is because therapists of color knows what kids of color are going through. Lived experiences is very powerful. It's something that can't be taught in education or in school. I want to see them from high school graduates to going into college to them calling us and saying, we finished, I'm going into psychology or into social work or into counseling. I want to see that the program actually create access for them. There's a growing need for more psychiatrists in New York. CBS 2's Jennifer McLogan shows us how nonprofits and schools are stepping up to fill the gap. I could have just had like an anxiety attack. As soon as I step into the studio, my whole like mind shift changes. In Old Beth Page, classes are filled at Attitudes in Motion. It offers them a safe space, somewhere where they feel that they can come and work and really succeed at something. Dance for me is definitely something that really helps with my mental health. If you don't address this now as children, um, you know, you, you don't have a healthy adult. Nonprofit agencies like North Shore Family and Guidance in Roslyn Heights, bilingual and bicultural, are stepping in to help children and families with anxiety and depression. We see the population um, with those symptoms getting younger and younger. Um, we're treating um, four-year-olds. This 13-year-old was teetering on the brink, bullied at school. It started affecting me in like third grade. I would get like really sad a lot. I'd have like anger problems. And back then it was like the end of the world. Giovanna became the hero of her own story, gaining strength and confidence with honest reflection. After a while I started like opening up and then I really started getting help and I started feeling better about myself. The CDC reports nearly three in five teen girls admitted to persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. One in three seriously considered attempting suicide. In Hicksville... If you need help, we can come out and, you know, help you where you're at, in the community, right there. Parents of children ages 10 to 21 make the call to Central Nassau. Guidance and counseling services are rolled right in. Sometimes we're just there to listen. And so in building that rapport, people begin to open up. Private rooms on vehicles for telehealth counseling, funded by the state for families in crisis. A mental health team at the ready here, but not everywhere. It's why more schools are creating spaces for mental health therapy. <sighs> An oasis inside Valley Stream Memorial Junior High, the wellness center. It's a great place for people to calm down, de-stress, talk about the problems. Chris Rar, inundated with sports. Alana Bolden, overwhelmed with academics and clubs. With the Wellness Center, you can like come with your friends and even by yourself. I'm glad we're equipped to have these resources to be able to reach these students. Coming up, the effects of childhood trauma and the New York City program aimed at helping children heal. A traumatic experience as a child can also impact a person into adulthood. Shame and guilt are some of the lingering feelings if not treated. CBS 2's Jesse Mitchell reports on one organization aimed at teaching historically underserved youth and those in foster care ways to overcome. Hi, Nyla Rose. As a rambunctious bunch of kids bounds into this quiet corner of PS 108 in East Harlem, their excitement is easy to see. I get to have fun and express myself kind of like recess, but there's like like no arguments. Gently lengthening our spine. They're learning how to center themselves inside and out through fostering meditation. Slowly rotate in the opposite direction. 
I love you guys. Founded by Demetrius Napolitano three years ago, the program now provides training to nearly 400 students here. What's present for you, Jair? Well, I like how he's aware of the whole room. Jair Rhodes noticed his own transformation taking shape after he met the man who would become his mentor. Before, when I was younger, I had anger issues and like I would get mad easily. And like when I started coming to his classes, he told me how to control my anger and be patient. Napolitano sees a lot of himself in this dedicated student. While I was here, I was in foster care. There was a lot of good moments, but there was also a lot of abuse in the home. So as a kid, I came to school and acted out a lot of that anger. A foster father eventually introduced him to yoga and meditation, and he discovered his purpose, returning to his old school to transform the room where he once served detention into a magical space. He also works with children served by three of the city's foster care agencies and advises adults to be mindful of their own triggers and reactions. If they see that the adults in, in their school reacting in this way and then at home they're reacting this way and then in the community they're reacting this way, children are going to mirror that. Instead, he's teaching them to be present and build the inner strength to face the stresses of daily you life. Touch the waterfall, make a wish. Ending each session with an affirmation made between themselves and the mirror. I feel like it's going to travel down to generations after this because me, I actually could probably want to teach meditation when I get older too. Namaste. Calm comes, confident the future has no limit. Jesse Mitchell, CBS2 News. If you're in need of mental health support, there's help available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Call 988 for the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Thanks for watching our special report, Breaking the Stigma, Children and Mental Health. I'm Cindy Shu. For more information and resources on everything you've seen in this special, head to our website, cbsnewyork.com, and click on Breaking the Stigma.